Hello, and welcome back to Let's Play Underrail Expedition with me, Bring It Down. Oh, forgot to speed up the game. There we go. Also, looking at where Captain Svan is standing, it looks like she's standing on top of open water. Because the rocks end on that tile. And she's not standing in in the shallows. She's standing on uh, on open water. Let's see if we can't find this, uh, what's well, essentially a dragon, a dragon being described. Or a dargon. Or a jargon, if you're a Dragon Quest fan. Ooh. I heard it. Come on out, dragon. Meet your maker. Point of there's no loot there. All right, I like this. I like this. This is cool. Oh, all right, into the uh, into the beast slayer. Even though it isn't immediately obvious, there is a small gap between the piled up rocks and the cave wall. Upon closer inspection, it seems like the gap is just wide enough for you to go through. Squeeze through the gap. You manage to reach the other side. Adira. Two robed women stand in the middle of a small cavern, facing each other. Their gleaming eyes become focused on you the moment you reveal your presence. The darkness of the cave, as well as that of their hoods, make it difficult for you to discern any facial features Discern any facial features, sorry, the typo got me, of these two women, but the details are not your concern right now. Their hostile poses are. One of the two women speaks with a frigid, unwelcoming voice. Identis identify yourself, visitor. Who are you, and what is your purpose here? I'm Brown Don, and I mean you no harm. The two women exchange looks, but not words. A short glance is all it takes for them to know what the other one is thinking, it seems. Brown Don, I am Adira. This is my sister Beatrice. Your purpose here, Brondon. Uh, I heard about the monster, Behemoth. The two women exchanged looks yet again. This time, their wordless communication took a bit longer than previously. Still, you eventually get your response. Many came here for this very reason. I'm sure you walked past the remains of, of some on your way in. What can you tell me about the Forsaken Behemoth? She smiles. You've gotten this far, so I think you deserve the truth. The Forsaken Behemoth doesn't exist. All the things you've been told are, in fact, false. Everything you heard is a product of my sister's skillful manipulation. If one has the ability to control fire, moving air to create frightening sounds is not an issue, especially when the entrance of the cave helps it resonate and reach the ears of superstitious ferrymen. I guess your ruse worked. You convinced a lot of people that this island is the home of a terrifying monster. Ironically, our whole plan also attracted a fair number of crazy monster monster hunters. At least what we suspect they were, since they came well armed. And some of them are really rude. They still haven't left the island to this day. It's impolite to overstay your welcome, I say. She flashes a malicious smile. So basically, there's nothing interesting on this island. No, unless you think hoppers and mine streams are interesting. Nothing interesting at all. The visitor meant other than the two of us. I'm sure of that. How did you two end up here, if I may ask? Allow us to tell you a story. Alright, I think you misheard me. <laughs> no, alright, you may start. You managed to catch a little smile on Adira's face, vanishing as quickly as it appeared. Even if it was there, only for a brief moment. You could tell that hiding behind that smile was not joy, but in fact, sadness. 
A young girl was born and raised in a small station far away from here. The girl had a twin sister whom she loved more than anything in this world. The two were inseparable. The sisters were inseparable, as most twins tend to be. As unfortunate as it is, several tragedies made the bond between the sisters even stronger than before. Their father, a good and caring man, died from the hands of a vile raiders that con constantly circled the station like packs of hungry rat hounds. Their mother, a gorgeous woman, and equally, if not more, caring than the father died from a broken heart. The little girl and her sister were left living in the with their grandmother, an old, disabled woman who could barely take care of herself, let alone feed and raise two young girls. The sisters never loved her. She was a selfish and, bit and bitter old woman. It was a miracle how she even managed to raise such a selfless and intelligent son, when she herself was quite the opposite. The next page of the story spells poverty and a life that was about to get even harder. The girl and her sister shared a gift. They were psionics. One was gifted with the ability to control fire, one the ability to control fo frost. Control is the wrong word here, but they had no real control over their abilities, and there was no one in that small forgotten station that could help them break that could help them embrace this ability that they possessed and teach them how to use it properly. Accidental fires, flying ice spikes, and an occasional occasional frozen doorknob quickly raised the whole station to its feet. The residents were filled with fear, as well as prejudice. The sisters were scared too. They didn't want to hurt anyone. They tried not to. It was a true horror. There was no one to guide them, show them the right way to use their abilities. No one to help them. All they got were looks of fear, pre fear and prejudice, and even hatred. Even their own grandmother proved even more useless and selfish than what the girls originally thought. Fear of it came to simple-minded. The girls were forced to leave in fear of their evil powers hurting the community. Grandmother had some pseudo-wise explanation which, at least in her own distorted mind, justified such actions. The sisters were given some money, some clothes, some food, and were told to go to Core City. There, someone could perhaps help them. Nonsense. The capital of decadence, torn apart by rioters, was luckily not the destination of the little sisters. They were sick of people, of the whole treacherous human race. The bastards. The inconsiderate walking piles of rat hound excrement threw us out, forced us out like we were, like we weren't even human beings. If we had been eaten by rabid animals right outside the station, they wouldn't have cared one stinking bit. They got rid of us. We were not their problem anymore, and that's all they cared about. She gives her sister a short glance. Naturally, a place, any place untainted by humans, was the best place for the little sisters to settle. Not only that, but it also had to be difficult for anyone to reach this place. The little girls tried to find a ferryman to take them to Forsaken Island, an island surrounded by dangerous currents that had doomed a vast number of unfortunate boats in the past and was often avoided. As there was no one willing to take them there, they had to steal their ride. The island offered them a little... Oh, sorry. The island offered them a life of isolation and sufficient resources to survive. They grew up, and many years later they eventually mastered their cursed gifts. They sought and gained control over the abilities that were a burden up to that point. In the end, they only succeeded... I'm oh, sorry. What am I saying? Man. I'm just making up words on the fly. In the end, they only needed each other in life. Through joint effort, they managed to survive through everything. And to this day, their bond is stronger than ever. And so are their powers. <laughs> Man, I'm looking forward to playing like a sassy playthrough. That's a really sad story. Some people are so small minded. But as you said, who needs those bastards? Well, what's, what's done is done. It's all in the past now. Ugh, I still hate them to this day. I wish. You wish nothing, Beatrice. Leave it be. I... She sighs. Yes, sister. I'll leave it be. Both of them fall silent. They seem to have drifted off, perhaps somewhere far back in the past. Uh, what do you do... What do you do to pass the time here? Besides fishing, picking mushrooms, and hunting hoppers? I like creating ice sculptures. I enjoy creating dancing flames of various shapes and sizes. We come up with interesting tales or just meditate, or practice our skills. Life here is not as boring as one might think. Trust us. Have you ever left this island after you came here? No. No. Why would we do that? We don't need anything from the outside world. We have everything we need right here. 
All right, well, I have to be leaving now. Goodbye. Where do you think you're going? I'm going on a new adventure. Did you really think we were going to let you just leave this place and tell anyone about what you witnessed here? But you seem talkative and friendly. No, honestly, it was interesting to hear m another voice. Perhaps something of the outside world. Not that it, not that it mattered. Not that it mattered much. Not that it matters much. Another typo. All right. Uh, in the end, we can't let you get out of here alive. Okay, kill me. Then my powerful friends, who know I'm here, will come looking for me. Armed to the teeth. I'm not going to succeed in a persuasion check. After all, they'll be expecting the behemoth to be here, so they'll pack quite a bit of firepower. Can you deal with all of them? Your excuse is pathetic. Let's get this over with. Alright. Son of a gun. Alright, so I need to take out Beatrice first. That's a really cool ability that I haven't seen used before. Alright, so it's hitting me. I don't like that. Alright, really need to take her out. Let's, um, let's do it this way. Or not. Oh, that's right, she has to do a spatial projection up. Son of a gun. <laughs> they both resisted. Uh oh, I might actually die here. I didn't plan for that. There we go. Nothing to it. Don't do it! Oh, that's really close to killing me. Okay, um... Alright, 65 health. I had more than I thought. Whew. That was close. Yep, that was close. Let's see. So whenever I shoot that darn acid thing, it it hits me. Is that the fault? Like, can I talk to him about that now? Sure, we'll take those. checking all these rocks because if we could interact with those rocks I just want to make sure I didn't miss anything else. Looks like we're good. Alright. Well, well, well.
trying to remember what the difference was between smart goggles and the uh, night vision goggles. And now I know. Did you hear that sound, kid? It's it's the behemoth. All right. Uh, well, I'm done here. Let's head. Let's get back. Finally. Hope you didn't leave anything important behind, because we're not coming back here, kid. Uh, I got everything. We can head back. You don't have to tell me twice. Hop on. So back to SGS. Which is good, because I need to go back to my private quarters and repair some stuff. So that works out. Let's go to... let's start here. Let's have those goggles I can sell. Get a medical, get fixed up. Also buy some adrenaline shots and um, there we go. Oh, let's get fixed up. So I don't have to waste uh, any money or resources. Get in my private quarters and do some repairing. Let's go ahead, top it off. Of acid vials for that darn weapon. That's not good. Alright, so we need to go talk to. Is it. I think it's Rista about the behemoth being fake. We need to go. Not merchants. So I guess up to the top. It'd have been cool though if um, there was an actual dragon you could fight. So I'm a fan of slaying dragons, especially well, in video games, not not in real life.
don't know, I feel like... Because dragons are like the peak of the fantasy encounter, if that makes sense. Uh, and it's really hard to top a good dragon fight in video games. It really, really is. I mean, look at Dragon's Dogma and uh, Dragon Age Inquisition. Even Dragon Age, like, Origins. Like, the, the dragon fights were just phenomenal. Like, the Grigori fight in Dragon's Dogma is probably still my favorite boss fight of all time. And it's really hard to top it. Uh, yes? I've been to Forsaken Island. Really now? And what did you find there? I found two psionic women living on the island. They were driven out of their community when they were young, which made them abandon society and set off to live on the Forsaken Island. They use their psionic abilities to create roars and effects to further scare away potential visitors. So that's what's been going on. Indubitably. This fire dis Indubitably, this fire display made those who saw it imagine a dragon-like being. Interesting. It really is. But that right there is the evidence that Behemoth is basically just an effect. A deterrent, not an actual living creature. He sighs. Well, as disappointing as it is, it's the truth. Luckily, I'm not paying you for my own pocket, so my personal dis disappointment is the only downside of your excursion. He laughs. Indeed. Here are your sharings, bro, as promised. He hands you 650 Stygian coins. I'm sure that covers the cost of the transportation and the like. That's all regarding th this matter. Alright, so no more jobs? Alright. Let us go talk to... Is it Georges? Hopefully I can turn it in. I only have three shots left, so unless I have to fire those three shots, then... I might just be out of luck. Unless she sells some. I don't think she does. Oh, she does. Okay, so if I need more, I can pick them up there. Oh, oh, oh. It's you, brother. Okay, here we go. There was a problem with the XAL dash... Well, that's a typo. It's the 001, not the 011. Yeah, see? XAL 001. I wonder if he'll correct me when I say that. But anyway, there is a problem with the XAL 011. A major problem. What? Magnificent shirt. He rubs his eyes. Tell me what happened, brother. At first it worked fine. But after some time, it started to leak. It started leaking acid and spraying it in all directions, even back at me. I, I am speechless. We performed numerous tests, but I guess we overlooked something. Magnificent shirt. His Excellency will not be happy. Luckily, he is not here at the moment. And, hmm. Listen, may I have the XAL 001 back so that we can investigate what caused the issue? And here you go. Give him the XAL 001. Thank you, brother. I'm very disappointed with this abortive test. I thought we had it, but alas. I'm sure you'll get it right next time. Yes, right. You have a point there. If we allow ourselves to be stopped by every op by every obstacle, we will never get anywhere. This is this is for you, brother. He hands you 350 Stygian coins. XAL, XAL. Magnificent shirt. Now, do you have any more work for me? Well, huh. Yes, why not? I do have something for you, Bron Don. I need a... he yawns. A test subject. Alright, what exactly do you have in mind? Listen. During the years, I've had some time to pursue a more personal project. That many of my colleagues are aware of, of what I'm doing, brother, so I ask of you to keep this between you and me. Now, uh, as an organic chemist... No, as an expert in the field of organic chemistry, I'll just be straight with you. I've been wishing to make the perfect alcoholic beverage. Yes, that's right. I'm making stronger li I'm making stronger liquor, approximately 50% alcohol content. Now that's decent, at least for me. That is, of course, not the most important thing. What is important is the taste, smell, consistency, and all the other qualities. You know, you'd like the drink itself to be enjoyable first and foremost, right? Is drinking even allowed in the Institute of Church? Hold on, I'm not finished. Uh, where was I? Yes, right. 
Now there aren't many natural ingredients containing adequate amounts of sugar to convert to alcohol during the distillation process. Not, not that are available to me at least. I mean there are some mushrooms which can be used technically, but church tentacles pull me down and strangle me. Those produce dreadful, those produce dreadful results. I have no idea how underrail folk can consume that swill. I'd unpardon me, but that thing's worse than boiled rat hound urine. To get to the point, the liquor I make is synthetic, but the aim is to produce a very pleasant result, as if it was nature's gift and not, well, laboratory meddling. Good enough even for our illustrious iodine himself. But one needs to be an expert, for even small mistakes can cause the end result to be disastrous. So I need a volunteer. Volunteer, yes. And that sounds a lot better than test subject. I need to remember that. Anyway, brother, I need a volunteer to try out several samples I have prepared. I'll be doing I'll be doing the testing with you, so do not worry. If I'm drinking it with you, you should know it's good. If you're interested, brother, I have everything close by, we can begin at any time. Alright, I volunteer to drink. Brother, we are doing important scientific work. We are not doing this out of pure fun. <laughs> now please wait for me while I inform Investigator Octavia that we are not to be disturbed. Get ready. Alright, time to take off my pants. It's the only way to drink, right? Yes, right. Doors closed, table, bottles, all here. Now I brought out a few samples. A few. There's like ten bottles here. I've been making them for quite some time, Brondon. There's there's even more that I haven't brought out. Now this batch picks up one of the bottles. Was made in um year ninety-eight. Let us start with that one. He pours the liquid into a pair of shot glasses with great care not spilling a single drop, and pouring the exact same amount into both and pouring exactly the same amount into both glasses. Then, he carefully closes the bottle, puts it aside, and then gives you one of the glasses while keeping the other for himself. There, smell it first and tell me what you think. By the way, you ever tell me what you call this drink? Alcacynth. I thought of a different names before, but this one is simple and precise. Now smell it and tell me what you think. Uh, smell the drink. You cautiously smell the drink. The scent is smooth and pleasant, with a slightly sweet, flowery note. At least reminiscent of those flowers you've had a chance to smell. In addition, it gently tickles your nose without allowing the strong, spirity smell to overpower it and make it reek like cheap hooch. All in all, you find it pleasing. I like it. It possesses a very smooth and flowery scent. Very nice. Apex. I'm glad you like it, and I agree with your assessment completely. Now let us taste it. I'll take a full sip. As you take the small sip, you immediately feel a warm sensation flowing down your throat, ending somewhere around the chest area, lasting a short period of time before going away. The taste is robust, rich, and has that smooth and mildly sweet flavor you expected after smelling it. Still, it is unmistakably a strong drink packing quite a punch, and its relatively mild taste could easily fool someone into having too much of it. George's places George's place his hand, places his hand on his heart and downs the drink in a single go. Oh 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 oh, good stuff. Very good. What did you think of it? Well, judging by the exquisite smell, I expected much I expected much from the taste, and I wasn't disappointed. Very good. Apex, I'm very glad you liked the taste of that one. Hope you like the next sample just as well. Let us move on. He pours two more glasses from the next bottle. Now, Brondon, I took great pride in this batch when I first made it in year 89. By the chert, that was a long time ago. Nowadays, I feel it is a bit... no. Saying it would influence your opinion. Try it first, and then we will talk. So, smell it first. He inhales with a smile on his face. Oh, good, good. He then places his hand on his heart and downs the drink in one gulp. Smell the drink. It seems that the smooth and flowery smell of the previous sample tricked you into thinking this one, too, will gently caress your nose. But instead, you experience an olfactory genocide. As it creeps through your nasal cavity, it dazes you like a potent drug, blurring your vision for a moment and making your head feel as if two trains went through your nostrils and collided inside your skull. And you haven't even tasted the thing yet. Well, if it doesn't kill you, take the shot. As time flies by and your bloodstream become, becomes less blood and more alcohol, you start losing your senses of taste and smell, and sight, and balance. Even the 
the familiar voice inside your head becomes like a bit more um, difficult to follow. Yes. George just downs his shot and looks at you. Approximately. Shirt magnificent. That one was good. Oh, oh, oh. What do you say? Smell the drink. You feel absolutely nothing. Yeah, good. Yes, right. Ch drink it, he hicks. Take the shot. You're, un you're unable to taste anything. Uh, I have no opinion on this particular sample. I suggest we just move on to the next one. Hicks. No, you must have an opinion. I made this for the 91st anniversary of Churtism, and it was a good batch. You know how much I love Chert and, and Iodine and all my brothers and sisters. But unfortunately, they didn't get the chance to taste it. Can I ask you a question? A question? <laughs> yes, ask. Why did you choose me, Brandon, me, to drink with you? Ah, there's a good reason for that, he hicks. You see, I'm cursed by my position, you know. I'm the head of this department and a respected investigator. Hmm. I've had people try to cut. I've asked people to try some of the liquor I make and tell me what they thought. They all said, it is Apex, Principal Investigator. Apex. But I know they wouldn't tell me the truth. Like, how do you tell a Principal Investigator that what he made with love is bad? If it was indeed bad. How? Huh? Understand what I'm saying, Brondon? He hicks. Yes. I mean, the other two principal directors, Rista and Steff, they were always honest and helped me with drinking, um, tasting the samples. But I simply needed someone who didn't know me for so long, and um, you came along. I needed valid, unbiased feedback. Ugh, yes. He yawns. I suddenly feel so tired. Drunkenness. I have something to tell you, uh, Georgia. I am listening, he hicks. I wonder what happens if we tell him the truth. Yeah, I punch the wall into oblivion with my fist in Hathor mine and unleash a torrent to drown a colony of burrowers. I'm, in, I'm tempted to tell the truth here. I saw Charta stealing this uh, thingy from a research facility in Core City. And I came to the Institute just to find it. Let's see. He almost pushes you over with a confused stare before turning the same one to the half empty bottle on the table. I don't think I'll drink this batch again. Yeah. It causes people to say funny things. Not Apex. I die and pardon me for baking it. Well, time to sample the next um, sample. How about this one? He randomly selects one of the bottles. What year is that? Your intricate question perplexes him. I don't remember. It's a year, I can tell you that. It was a long time ago. Maybe when Monsignor Braddock, the Institute's historian, died. Maybe, um, ten years ago? I don't know. Let's drink. Keep on drinking. Yawns. Um, turn his evolution, Brondon. Yawn in unison with him. How are you feeling? Yeah, what the hell happened? Science happened, Brondon. Science. Unfortunately, or fortunately, no one in the department or otherwise was there to see how dedicated we were to science. I think, that is. I got some good results, which I'll, which I'll analyze them later, once my head is well again. As for you, Brondon, your input was incredibly valuable, and therefore, I give you this. He hands you 300 Stygian coins. Thank you for your time and dedication. It is appreciated. He yawns. Do you need anything else? Nope, I think we're done with his quests. Alright, I'm going to call it here, and in the next episode, we will head towards the west... Actually, let's just go stand in front of the west wing. <sighs> yep.
A young woman approaches you, fully wrapped in a churdus robe. Even her hands. Only her pale face is revealed. She looks at you and smiles shyly before speaking with a soft and fragile sounding voice. Brandon, I'm glad I found you. Chert is evolution. Why doesn't anyone come up and say, Invictus, your destructiveness. Finally, I found you. Allow the simple messenger to kneel before your might. You get the idea. She seems almost startled by her, your response. Her, her eminence, Ep, uh, Epsisco, Ep, oh my goodness, Epsicopos Lydia. She wishes to see you. I was, um, instructed to tell you to report to her office as soon as you have the time. Sorry if I started you, sister. I could see her eminence at once. She nods. Sure guide you, brother. Alright, maybe we'll talk to her next episode, then we'll go to the West Wing. One thing at a time. I think she's up here. Or up here. Yeah, okay. Alright, I'm gonna call it here, and in the next episode we will talk to, uh... Yes. Oh, there's a typo. See, the messenger said Epsi, like the I and the S were mixed up, and it was Epsicopos. That's why I couldn't say it, but it's Episcopos, which is much easier to say. Anyway, I'm going to call it here. Next episode, we will talk to her and see what she wants, and then we will go to the uh, the West Wing. Get a lot of experience. We will level up here very shortly. Looking forward to that. Anyway, thanks for watching. Hope to see you guys in the next episode.